Okay. Let's pretend all that never happened. I'm not convincing anybody. My name is uh, Martin Dirksen. I work for uh, uh, bol.com, bol.com, and I want to tell you about Mayfly today, a project that we've been developing internally at uh, Bol for uh, uh, close on a year and a half now. We've been sort of telling people about it to see if what we're doing excites them or if they think it's really boring or if they think it's really not the way to go. And uh, so far, the response has been pretty good, so that's why I wanted to tell you about it today. Um, first of all, a little sort of the, the, the sentence that it says in the package. Uh, Mayfly is a Docker-based, user story-centered development platform written by and in use at uh, bull.com. What all that means, I will explain in a moment. First, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, or rather, tell you what, what I'm going to talk about. A bit of background, why did we develop this platform? What does it do for us? What problems does it solve? Uh, what are the principles behind it? So what, what are the sort of core ideas behind the, uh, uh, the actual platform? Going to give a small demo. Uh, if the uh, the demo gods are are gracious to me, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into a bunch of the aspects of the of the platform, and then finally I'll tell you a little bit about the state that it's in at the moment internally at the company and what we have planned for the future. So, a little bit about my the company that I work for, Bull.com. We are the largest online uh, uh, retailer in the Netherlands and in Belgium. Uh, we have in the IT organization, which is about roughly a quarter of the entire uh, company, uh, 42 scrum teams. Uh, it seems like there's a, a new one every week, but 42 at the moment, with about five to eight people on a team, and it's usually multidisciplinary, so there's database engineers and, and Java developers and information analysts and some people that do all those things. We have a pretty strong Scrum culture. We we did like a sort of cold turkey uh, migration to a Scrum process in 2009, and we've been using it ever since. We've we've done a bunch of bull specific like, highlights to uh, to the whole process, but Scrum is really ingrained in our DNA as an IT organization. We've got a landscape behind the web show behind the web uh, site itself of about 130 different services and applications. Most of them are, are like a Java database combination. There's a, there's a bunch of sort of exotic things written in Go or uh, JavaScript or other things, but most of it's Java. And finally, we have a, a deployment model, which is like a mix of a, a four-week sprint in which everything gets deployed in one big bang. And there's a whole bunch of teams now that are starting to experiment with all kinds of continuous delivery methodologies. And I, to enable that is one of the reasons that we developed Mayfly. So. Um, why did we develop Mayfly? We had, uh, we had the following problem, or the following situation. We have uh, four teams, let's say, and they're all developing their user stories. They're all developing on the master branch, and they're all deploying their applications, their services, to the shared test environment. And this this model is, is a model that was actually prevalent within bull.com up until not that not that long ago. So what happens and oh and we have a shared Jenkins environment where everybody builds their code. So everybody's working on this on this big shared test environment where all the code gets tested and where all the code is to a large extent developed as well. So what happens when we have a problem in one of the user stories? Did everybody see that little lightning icon? I was, I was worried it might be too small, but does that come across? Yes? Excellent. Are you all awake? Because I hear, I literally hear like absolutely nothing. Okay. And I can't see very much either. Okay. So what happens when there's a problem with one of the user stories? Well, if the code is broken in some way that is, um, that is still broken, but not broken enough to actually break the build, then it gets deployed onto the test environment. And that service could be broken in some way and that service is now in use by the entire organization. Everybody testing on the test environment is now using that broken service. So what happens is the other teams that are dependent on the service get upset because it's broken. Someone's deployed broken code to, uh, to the test environment. And then usually what happens is the team that deployed the broken code gets very nervous and starts sweating a bit because they have to either 
roll back the code, but then they have to make sure that nobody else depends on their new features, or they have to fix it as fast as possible. But in any case, until it gets fixed, the test environment is degraded for everybody that's using it. And because it's a central test environment, everybody uses it. So we, we took a look at the situation about two years ago, and we thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could give every team and perhaps even every user story its own environment? So you go to a situation where you have a production environment. You have a team that develops user stories. They develop that user story on a separate branch in the, in the Git repository. They have an entirely separate bunch of Jenkins jobs that build that specific branch. And they have an entirely separate isolated runtime environment that actually runs that code as if it were a test environment or that it is the actual test environment, except that they're the only ones using it. And then finally, when it's done, that code gets deployed directly to production. So no intermediate test or acceptance or integration environments, just test it in isolation, develop it in isolation, accept it in isolation, and when it's done, deploy it directly to production. Wouldn't that be nice? Because once you do that, that team can um, develop several stories in parallel, and in fact, Multiple teams can actually develop multiple stories in parallel. And once something goes wrong in one of those stories, see the little lightning icon, something went wrong in one of those stories, and that code gets deployed, the only thing that will break is the actual runtime environment for that particular story. It will not break anything central, anything shared. And so all the other teams will not be impeded by the fact that someone has checked in some broken code. And once you do that, oops. Once you do that, you can actually scale to a X amount of teams, X amount of stories, because uh, an X amount of applications, because nobody will ever be in a situation where they impede other teams from doing their work, as you as you would have with a shared test environment. So that was the idea, and that that was the idea behind Mayfly, and that's what we set out to achieve. That and a bunch of other things that I'll, I'll tell you about in a moment that are um, also very important, but. This is the, the main problem that we set out to solve. So some of the central concepts behind Mayfly are that the user story should be the unit of work. So like I said, we have a pretty strong sc scrum culture within Bull, um, and the user story itself is like the, the most atomic piece of work that, that, is, that exists within Mayfly. And because everybody uses the, the more or less the same scrum methodology, it fits, we can, tailor it pretty well to sort of fit our way of working. And we drive the workflow from JIRA. So setting up this isolated environment, making the, uh, the branches, et cetera, et cetera, it's not something you have to do manually. It's something that should be done automatically by the Mayfly platform uh, using events that are emitted from JIRA. Because JIRA, the issue management system we use is, is where you keep track of you know, which story is in progress and which story is done, et cetera, et cetera. We wanted to give our development teams as much control as as possible over the entire process. So we used, uh, we decided that the the sort of basic building block would be a Docker image. Um, we don't care what happens inside your build as long as it produces a Docker image, which we can then run. And because a Docker image can run more or less anything, you can do whatever you like in your project, and we can still work with it in the Mayfly platform. Gives developers a lot of control over how they um, how they build their apps and, and how they want to run their apps. We use feature branches and pull requests, and we also have mechanisms whereby these pull requests can be accepted by the, the team that has operational excellence over a particular service, so that no team can change code in a service that is not theirs without the team for that is responsible for that service actually approving it, knowing about it. And not only doing a code review, so not only looking at the code and saying, well, I guess it looks good to me, so why not merge it? But also having the entire build, um, build CI pipeline and a running environment that ensures that stuff actually works before you merge it into the master branch. So before you make it, before you push it to everybody else. And finally, um, we use Jenkins to, to, do, uh, to do most of our builds, or to do almost all of our builds. And there's a, a great plugin called the JobDSL plugin, which lets you script Jenkins, so generating job, or um, configuring jobs, et cetera, et cetera, can be something you can do automatically. And we actually 
uh, spawn completely new Jenkins jobs every time a, uh, a new user story is created, just to make, just to give it this isolation from everything else. <coughs> give every user story an independent runtime environment for developing, testing, and acceptance. So that's really important. Everything that you do on a user story, so when you when you start a new user story on application, you should have your own runtime environment where that version of the application is running, that you can test, that you can access, that you can run your automated tests against, and that you can even go to the business and say, hey, this feature, I've developed this feature on this uh, environment here, could you please go there, check that it's to your liking, and then accept it so that we can take it to production. That's obviously a challenge because we don't want to stand up the entire bold.com landscape for every single user story. That would be prohibitively expensive in terms of resources. So there are some tricks that we did to, to make that work. And done, as in the scrum definition of done, like a story is done when it, um, when it uh, satisfies a bunch of requirements, should mean that it's ready to go directly to, directly to production. So there shouldn't be any sort of intermediate environments that it sh first has to pass through. No like performance testing should have to be done. No other kind of testing on some separate environment where a whole bunch of stories are aggregated. No, done means deploy it. So this is what Mayfly does. Per user story, you get a feature branch in source control. And currently, we use uh, Git and we use Stash as a, a repository manager. You get a continuous integration environment, which is just a bunch of jobs uh, in Jenkins that are generated for you according to your own job DSL uh, specification. You get an isolated production-like <laughs> runtime environment, which is essentially a Docker cluster running your application. And then uh, you get an automated definition of done check. So definition of done is a, is a scrum principle, which is uh, essentially a list of uh, requirements that you have to satisfy before a story can be considered done. And I don't know how many of you actually use Scrum in your day-to-day -day work, but you might recognize the phenomenon where you get together, have a meeting, you define your definition of done, and you feel really good about yourself, and then you put it in a drawer somewhere, put it on a wiki page somewhere, and then six months later you think to yourself, damn, we had a definition of done, we should really update that thing. And you never look at it in the meantime. Um, that's the experience of a whole bunch of teams within Bull, and we wanted to give people a, uh, we wanted to give the teams a way to actually programmatically define the bunch, the requirements that have to be satisfied for a story to be done, and then have the platform check those for every commit that gets done in a particular story. Now obviously, that means that you can't define really fuzzy things, like you can't have a definition of done rule that says, I should feel good about this change, because there's no way to quantify that, but stuff like, the coverage must be exactly the same as before for the unit tests, or the acceptance test must, must pass, or someone from team A must approve this change. That's the kind of thing you can actually put into that definition of done and have it get checked on every single commit on every single story. Logs and metrics. So just the, the sort of standard uh, infrastructure we have for, for all of our stuff also gets tied into these user story environments so you can check their logs and their metrics um, for those particular versions of the applications that you're developing. And finally, an optional per user story database that gets provisioned along with the actual user story specific uh, service that you can use for testing or just running your application. Okay, demo time. Um, so I had this all set up and then I had to restart my computer, so bear with me for one second. That does not bode well. <laughs> One second. Oh, I have no internet connection at all, which is... So what I'm going to show you is uh, I'm going to develop a story on a test project that we have that we 
used for occasions like this. And I'm, I'm going to run through the entire c cycle of um, spinning up the, the user story specific environment and then developing the story, um, making some changes in the code, seeing that it gets deployed to the environment, and then uh, actually merging it back to production, or in this case, not actual production as in the bool.com website, but production for this test project. But of course, none of that will happen if I don't get a network connection. <coughs> you might wonder why I'm looking up there instead of down here, because that part of the screen is not actually on the screen. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Okay. <coughs> All right. So we go to Jira. Yeah, oh, now I can actually look here again. And we go to the project that we're going to um, actually modify. I'll just increase the sizes just a bit so it's easier to see. So the first thing we do, like I said, the whole thing is tied into the Jira workflow. So the first thing we have to do is create an issue. So we're going to create a, a user story because, like I said, the whole thing is user story based. Devox demo. And then we actually created a plugin for Jira to, to give us a bunch of added functionality that helps with instructing the Mayfly platform as to um, which source control repository should be used for a particular story. And in this case, it's, the, uh, it's this little CD application field right here where I will choose the, uh, the demo uh, project and then create the issue. So we take a look at the issue. And then the other thing we did with the, with the plugin is provide a bunch of actual extra panels uh, in the uh, in the actual uh, user store or in the actual issue uh, view. So we have here uh, assets, which is empty because we don't actually create any assets like a, a runtime environment or Jenkins jobs for user story unless it goes uh, into the to do stage instead of the uh, uh, instead of or unless it goes into in progress instead of to do rather. And then we have the definition of done, which it, uh, which it gets from the, uh, the master, which already has the definition of done defined. And in this case, there's a whole bunch of unknowns because we haven't yet run any builds or there's no environment up and running. So it, the only thing that it knows is that the, the feature as now, because we haven't actually made any changes yet, is up to date with the master. All right, so we start progress. And that'll actually trigger the Mayfly platform to, to provision a whole bunch of these resources, which will appear in a moment. And in the meantime, I will show you. Oops. In the meantime, I will show you the bull.com stash server. And the. Uh, So this is the repository for the um, um, for the project. 
which contains uh, just a normal, it's just a normal Java project with a Gradle build. And it has only one specific thing for the, the whole Mayfly uh, uh, platform, which is this folder called Flywheel. And in there is a bunch of stuff that I, that I talked about earlier. For example, you have your dod.xml file, which I will also increase in size slightly. This is an XML file where you can actually define the DOD rules um, that will be applied to every commit on your project. So in this case, we have, um, we have uh, one that's simply called unit test rule, which means that the unit tests must all pass. Otherwise, the definition of done isn't satisfied. Uh, someone from this list of people must approve the change. Otherwise, the definition of done isn't satisfied. And we've actually made it extensible so that teams can write their own rules. So if a team were to say, I only want to deploy stuff on a Wednesday, they could actually write a rule that enforces that on a platform level. Wouldn't be very practical, but you could do it. And then we have the project.dsl, which is essentially the, uh, the definition for the bunch of uh, Jenkins jobs that will build the project. Not quite as uh, clean of a DSL as, it, as we'd like it to be yet, but gets the job done. So if you're familiar with the job DSL uh, plugin, this is just a basic job DSL Groovy file, or Groovy code, rather. And then finally, we have the service descriptor. And the service descriptor actually contains things like, you know, what's the project called? How many resources should it get when it gets deployed to the cluster? Um, should, we a, uh, should we deploy a database alongside the project so that it can use the database? Different configuration things that um, uh, that we need in order to actually uh, deploy to the cluster effectively so you can use the project to do useful work. So now if we go back to the, um, if we go back, if we go back to the assets tab here, you'll see that a whole bunch of assets appeared. And uh, for example, the logging asset is just a link to our internal logging uh, infrastructure where the logs from this particular user story environment end up. Uh, the branch is a, a link to stash to the particular branch that's been created specifically for this uh, user story. The pipeline asset is a link to the Jenkins jobs. And finally, we have the, um, the application, which is uh, a link to the actual running instance of the application for this user story. So let's take a look at those things real quick. So the stash. Um, branch is um, the branch is actually called the same thing as the use as the uh, issue key in Jira that's what we use to correlate all the different pieces of information so this right now there's no there's no difference between the, uh, the the branch and the master because we haven't done anything yet the pipeline has also been created it's on a uh, three Jenkins jobs which of which the build job is the actual one that will build the uh, build the project when we do a commit. So it's like your normal CI workflow. You do a commit. The system notices, does a build, pushes the new artifact, which in this case is a Docker image. And then finally, we have the actual uh, application running here. So the application itself, and I should warn you, you have to brace yourselves because it's quite something to behold. If it works. <laughs> Oops. Um, there should be dragons and dancing ponies, but apparently, maybe not today. I don't know. <laughs> In any case, it's a it's a really simple project just to sort of demonstrate the uh, uh, the entire uh, process. I should note that along with the uh, this version of the project, we also have a um, a version of the production uh, uh, a production version of the project running, which simply lives at the the username. Um, so this is this is the original version, shall we say? This is the version we're modifying in a in a specific user story environment. And when once we complete the user story and and move the code to production or 
it will actually change this page. So this is a different page, a different service, uh, a different running instance from the, the from this one. And this is the this is the actual instance where you do your development. So let's do that now. We'll um, let me let me uh, make that a bit bigger. Not with the equal sign, but with the okay. So we um, we go to the uh, DPIT project. We do a git pull, and then we see that the um, um, or rather we see that the actual feature that for which the branch was created by the platform gets pulled in. So it has the same uh, it has the same Jira key as uh, the, the issue. That's like I said. That's how we correlate everything. So if we then go and actually uh, change something, and in this case we'll change just the the index page, and we'll change it from the uh, company at which I gave the last demo <laughs> to DevOx, and then in the actual body itself. We'll change that to DevOx. Oops, DevOx. So let's close that. So now we have, we've got the change. We'll commit it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's an excellent point. Uh, get checkout. So we do the uh, um, DP DPI. Oops, DPI T. Yeah, that's a good point. We should actually uh, check out the branch itself before we make any. To go back and peek at what the actual uh, issue key was. Five six nine seven. All right. Five six nine seven. So then we still have the change. Excellent. L let's see. Oops. Like I said, if I also forget how to type, it'll become really difficult. So we've got the change. I will commit it. So and then we'll push it. And once we do that, the um, the build job will kick in and will actually start a new build. So you can see from the logs here, it's just a, a normal Gradle build um, with one uh, added thing and that at the end of the entire build, it actually produces a, uh, or it builds a new Docker image, which it then pushes to the internal registry, which then gets deployed. And that's it's just a simple uh, sort of Docker extension to Gradle that we that we coded up, which is it's pretty easy to do. And you can see here that actually makes a new uh, d Docker image, and we'll then push it out to the registry. At which point, uh, this is the platform will deploy it to the uh, user story environment. So. While we're waiting for that, um, so if you go here to the uh, uh, to the branches and stash, you can actually see that the um, the branch for our story has been created here. And then if you go to the pull requests, you can actually see that the pull request, which takes the code that we've modified in the branch and applies it to the master, has also been automatically created. And not only has it been created, but it's also been, because we have this rule and the definition of done that you have to approve it, uh, there's an approve button here that you, we have to, you have to actually tick before, you can, before it can be merged. Now, I realize I'm approving my own 
change, and you might be wondering, how does that work? It's just because otherwise I would always have to have like a colleague somewhere in the back approving my changes if we actually close that particular security loophole. So that's why that works, but it's just a demo. So, so the build is a success. And then we go to the, uh, to the actual user story environment, which is this. And I should be getting any moment now. Sometimes it takes a while to deploy. But I should be getting hello DevOx instead of hello world. And you can actually see because the, um, the actual deploy is done by Marathon, Oops. which is a uh, Marathon is a um, kind of like a pass layer on top of Mesos, which actually deploys to Docker containers. So if we go there, we can actually see the uh, <coughs> the myriad of DPIT containers being being deployed, but this is ours, so it should be finished. Ah, here we go. Okay, we've now changed the user story environment and seen that it deploys, it works, everything is cool. Now we go, we go back to the, uh, the Jira issue. And we go back to the uh, definition of done. And now we see that everything is, is all right. Everything's passed. The unit test passed. The build ran the unit test passed. The current feature branch is up to date with master. That's, log that's pretty logical because we haven't done any other changes. And the branch should yield a valid artifact that actually runs and which has been, uh, which, we don't, which I demonstrated just now. So actually, it delivers a working artifact. It's also really important. One of the rules you can't actually turn off because otherwise there's, you know, what's the point? The only thing that hasn't um, that we haven't done yet is prove the change. So let's go ahead and do that. Prove. So we also built a plugin for Stash, which does this kind of, uh, which notifies the platform, the Mayfly platform, with these kinds of things like approvals of code, and which uh, helps in uh, various admin functions that we built uh, that we need in Stash to actually work properly. And then if we go back to the uh, definition of done, and we refresh it. Everything's passed. So it's picked up on the fact that someone's approved the, uh, the code. So now that we're happy with everything, we say resolve uh, in Jira. And once again, we get the definition of done. So we can check that everything's all right. If something doesn't, if something doesn't satisfy, or if some part of the definition isn't satisfied, you actually cannot resolve the issue. So you cannot commit stuff that doesn't uh, satisfy the definition of done. And when we resolve, it'll actually merge the code into master. It won't actually rebuild the artifact because we we ensure that any chain, the only changes between the the user or the the story branch and master are the actual changes in the story branch. So it takes the uh, the Docker image that it created for the story environment and deploys that to the pr to the production environment because that's that would be the exact same thing as building another Docker image based on the uh, on the master branch. What it does do is it cleans up a whole bunch of stuff on the uh, uh, the various places that uh, we've created stuff. So if you go to the uh, the branches overview here, you see the branch is actually uh, is gone. Um, then if you go to the uh, um, Jenkins jobs, you'll see the Jenkins jobs have actually disappeared as well. This is the user story environment that's been cleaned up. And then if we finally go to the production environment where the code should be merged, and the demo gods are uh, gracious to me and <laughs> took a while on the, on the user story environment as well. So there we go. All right, so that's the entire life cycle. You know, I always feel so ambivalent about when people clap about that, when people clap when I show this, because on the one hand, it's nice to get some sort of recognition for the fact your demo works, but the other hand, it's like you set the bar so low, like I'm here to show you something, and then it actually, 
what I'm what I want to show you works and then you clap as if you were expecting them not to work kind of I don't know it gives me really ambivalent feelings about the whole thing but I, I, I enjoy the applause nonetheless. All right. So I just showed you in the entire life cycle of a story, we get a separate, uh, separate isolated container, containerized environment where you can actually do your development. You can also do your acceptance. You can say to your business, uh, to your product owner, hey, look, it says DevOps now. Is that cool? Yes, that's cool. Okay, so we can deploy it to production. Everything separate for that user story alone, which is exactly what we set out to do. So I will... Um, I will reload this presentation because I didn't have internet, apparently. All right. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the architecture. <laughs> the architecture, which has all kinds of nice icons in it, but. Ah, that's a good point. Yeah, let's try that. Sorry about this. Let me just. Never install Linux on your Mac. It only leads to problems. <laughs> All right. So this is the in this is the internals of the uh, of the project. Ah, oh, there we go. This is the internals of the project. It's uh, the platform itself consists of a, whole a bunch of microservices that do different things, like uh, actually create the uh, environment in Marathon for you, talk to Stash, um, create the database, uh, create database containers that actually give you your database, which you can work with in a user story environment, uh, instrument Jenkins, uh, talk to Jira, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so this this all lives sort of outside of those those components, um, but it runs on top of on top of a marathon. So Mesos is a, a a way to essentially take a whole bunch of computers and make them into one big computer. A marathon is like a pass layer on top of that, and then we use Docker to actually run everything. This is when we first did this, it was pretty cutting edge. Now it's more or less pedestrian because everybody does it like that, but it works, so it's cool. And then we have a, an internal service called Triangle, which we developed, which actually does database provisioning for different kinds of databases. So the branching model. One of the, um, one of the important things that we have to uh, actually ensure is that we never get merge conflicts between the different stories as they're merged to production. So the way we do that is as follows. So we have the master branch for every project. Then if someone starts developing a feature, he actually branches out from the master branch adds a couple of commits. There's a pull request. And someone does a, uh, someone checks the box that it's OK, and then it gets merged. But what if, at the same time, someone else is actually developing another feature, and that person actually finishes that feature before the other guy is finished with his? So now, the uh, George on CCE 23 actually gets a, uh, will get a merge, uh, will get a merge error will get a merge conflict if by chance he has edited some of the same code or he will be behind master in any case if he tries to do this pull request here. So in order to prevent that, what we do is every time a story is closed, we take the code from that story, so the code, the difference between master and that story, and we push it out. I said push it out. We push it out to every other open story at the same time. So that guarantees two things. One that your, that your uh, feature branch will never be behind master, and two, that any merge conflicts that arise from the fact that you have different code in your feature branch will have to get solved not on master, but on the feature branch. That means that master is always deployable, which is really important. So then George can fix whatever merge conflicts 
there are, and then finally, when the system goes to merge, uh, when the platform goes to merge the actual code from his branch back to master, it'll all work. So that's how we ensure that everything is always up to date with master, and we can merge any given feature branch to master at any time automatically. By which I mean, when you click resolve in Jira, Stash will actually do the work for you, and you don't have to do it yourself. Another thing we always try to sort of explain is why we have no integration environment. And when we first started talking about this, there were a lot of people that said, I need an integration environment. And actually, I, I forgot to do the uh, little animation where it shows up when you hit the spacebar, because it's a lot more dramatic when, you know, no, you don't pops up. But we don't actually think you need an integration environment. And why is that? Well, or to be more precise, we don't think it's worth having an integration environment. So let's go back to the way that, that we internally at Bull used to develop software. We had this four-week cycle where every team used to work on their code for four weeks and then finally deliver a new version which would get deployed to the acceptance environment and finally to production. So if you look really carefully, it's like the most subtle animation or subtle change in slides ever, but you can actually see the versions running through from dev to production. That's the way it used to work. Now, if you want to move to a more continuous delivery style of delivering your applications, that means that all those teams will get a chance to choose their own rhythm of release. And if you still want to keep this integration environment, what is an integration environment? Well, integration testing on an integration environment is essentially testing a known combination of services for a particular amount of time. If you don't know what you're testing, you may as well not test it. So you have to know which combination of versions you are testing for any particular set of time in order for your integration test to make sense. That's important. Now, let's say you move to a continuous delivery model and every team gets the freedom to choose whatever cycle they want. So the first team is still on the four-week cycle. The second team decided to go to a four-day cycle. The third team is a near shoring or is an offshore team in Guatemala and they have the Mayan calendar. Nobody knows what the hell they're doing, but they're releasing. And the last team just releases whenever they feel like it. They have no schedule. So now you go to your integration tests because you still want to do that. You have to lock the integration testing environment in terms of what versions are on that environment for a particular amount of time to do your testing. Because again, if you don't know what you're testing, you might as well not test. There's no point in testing unknown versions of are known combinations of application versions. What that means is, at for as long as you're doing your, app, your acceptance testing, your integration testing, those teams that are on a schedule that is actually faster in terms of releasing features than, your, than the duration of your acceptance test or integration test will be stuck. So let's say your acceptance test or your integration test takes five days, for instance, because you have really complex um, performance tests or whatever. That means that three of the four teams will actually be stuck in their deployment. They can't actually deploy new features because they have to wait for that acceptance test to finish. You've just created a huge bottleneck in your system if you want to give your teams the, uh, the possibility of actually releasing stuff on a schedule that they decide. So then the question becomes, what's the point of integration testing if what you can test can change at any time? And what's the point of integration testing if it means blocking all those teams that want to deploy on a schedule that you don't control? So then we say, well, there is an integration testing environment that's already out there that you don't have to create. And it's called production. And it's really cool because it has all this production-like load and production-like data. And you can actually, it's, it's usually the most well-instrumented and monitored platform in the entire organization. So what we, th what we uh, decided to do with Mayfly and, and getting rid of the integration testing environment is to say, okay, if you, define, if you have the service-oriented architecture with well-defined um, interfaces between the different components, then we think it is worth the risk of occasionally finding bugs in production, which, to be honest, we d you do anyway and we do as well, in order to get this extra speed for those teams that want to release at their own pace and not do this integration testing step. So it's a trade-off, and, and the trade-off, as far as we're concerned, is, um, or is more positive when you say, get rid of the integration testing environment 
and actually do the integration testing itself, or the integration testing that you want to do on production, and do as much sort of isolated testing as you can before you actually deploy to production, but don't do integration testing. Does that make sense? Yes? No? Yeah. So what's the current state of the project? All right, we've almost gotten GA within, uh, within the company itself. We're signing up more and more teams to actually um, um, uh, use the Mayfly platform. It's really important to the, to the team that I'm on, the team that's actually writing the platform, that we don't have any sort of company-wide um, um, edict that says you must use this platform. We want to e entice people to use it. And if we can't, then that means there must be something wrong with the platform. We have really robust support for Java services and uh, their databases. Now, you might say, well, it's just a Docker container that comes out of the build. Why is the support for Java more robust than other things? It's because of the Gradle plugin and the, the integration we have with that. It's just easier to do a Java project than it is to do a Ruby project, for instance. Although, Ruby project it shouldn't be that much harder. It's used by 12 teams internally. and. Obviously, uh, we, uh, the team that's developing Mayfly, use it as well to actually uh, develop the services that make up the platform. So the future, better monitoring and alerting of the platform itself. And uh, to this end, we're, uh, we're pretty far along in sort of um, doing a proof of concept of a tool called Prometheus, which is a, a really nice new monitoring tool uh, built by the guys at SoundCloud. Better service discovery support. Right now, we use console to sort of wire services together, but we don't use it to the uh, full extent that we actually should. So uh, there's more work to be done in that, uh, in that respect. Multiple applications per story environment. Right now, if you launch a story environment, you get one application, the one you're working on. We want to make it possible for people to actually launch two applications and do the entire orchestration thing with the source control management, et cetera, et cetera, with two applications simultaneously for those, uh, those occasions in which you actually need to develop a feature which has so much code in both services that you actually need to coordinate that a little bit better than just developing one part and then developing the other in sequence. Actually deploy from Mayfly to production. So the platform itself, the endpoint right now is the, uh, the, our own test platform, which is, uh, which is still good because that means the test platform gets a lot more stable than it used to be when everybody was developing directly on the test platform. But we actually want to deploy from Mayfly directly to production. But that has all sorts of other problems, like actually getting the operations guys to support Docker in production, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, we want to open source it. You might have been thinking this is all well and good, but what the hell does this have to do with me? Well, we're going to open source it, so you can use it too. I used to, I used to promise like we're going to open source it by the end of this year, but I, yeah, I can't really promise that anymore. The only thing I can promise is that we will open source it, and it won't take a year. I hope. <laughs> um, that's it. Um, there's, uh, there's two websites you can check out. The, the Mayfly CD website is actual information about the project itself. The, the, pro the information that we've uh, uh, published, a couple of presentations that we've given before. And then there's uh, the bull.com GitHub account, which has a bunch of other projects as well. And because we paid for this presentation, I should say, we're hiring. If you want to come work for us, work on stuff like this, uh, please see me or come to our booth uh, uh, later. All right. Any questions? Yes. Right. So the question is, what does it take? What would it take to run a local uh, local Mayfly behind your own firewall? Uh, it's essentially um, the the uh, the architecture uh, s slide I showed earlier is essentially you need a Mesos cluster, you need Marathon running on top of that, and you need console, and that's it. And that may sound like a lot, but once we open source it, we'll provide a, a really easy, uh, for example, Docker Compose script or a, uh, a Vagrant environment in which you can really easily test this and good documentation as to how to set it all up. So uh, as long as you have the, the baseline of Marathon and Mesos and console, things will, will basically work. And the, the Mayfly itself will, will make sure that every part of it is running and uh, configured correctly. 
Yes. Yeah, sorry, you. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. For every branch, or yeah. every story branch, basically, uh, I guess there are multiple stories developed or uh, running in parallel. Yeah. Which means a lot of environment. Yes. Uh, you just pay a lot, or how do you <laughs> affect that you spin up that much? So the the question is, if you spin up an environment for every user story, doesn't that mean you spin up a lot of environments, and doesn't that become prohibitively expensive? Yes, we spin up a lot of environments, but um, because we use Docker. Uh, an environment is essentially a database process and a Java process. That's it. And um, so you could, you could, I guess, do the same thing with VMs, but that would become really resource heavy. But that's exactly why we chose to use Docker, because it's, Docker is nothing but a, a sort of wrapper around a, a, a process at the OS level. So a new environment, in, in the case of the, the story, or in the case of the service, I was just, the demo service is just literally a new Java process, and you can pack a lot of those onto modern servers. So, yes, we start a lot of environments, but Docker makes that fairly feasible and uh, not too expensive. And then my question yeah. yeah. So, uh, um, I'm still worried or confused with the fact that uh, stories at the end come together. Mm -hmm. One has proven to be fine. Yeah. Then you have multiple, and then at a certain moment they come together. Right. Yeah. Conflicts should we see immediately, things you cannot really see immediately, but stuff that's running, but maybe not good. You, you, and certainly if you push it directly to production, that, that's tricky. Yeah. So the question is, if you have a lot of stories being developed concurrently, then um, and you have the code being merged into the different story environments, there, or code being merged into the master and back out to the stories, you should have a, a good way of seeing that nothing is broken apart from just the stuff compiles and that uh, that it, it that it deploys exactly. That's that's absolutely true, and this ties into the whole um, integration testing on production um, that I talked about earlier. You have to have a pretty comprehensive suite of of tests on the API level, on the functional level for your service that should pass before you actually mark your story as resolved. So that's the whole sort of Amazon way of development. Like everything, every service is. Uh, Every service has, it, has just an API that it publishes to the outside world, and every other service within your company should be treated like an external API. That's the kind of, um, yeah, the kind of model you should adopt if you want to use this. Because exactly bec ex precisely because we're going directly to production, the guarantees that you want from, from your user story environment should be a lot more, or a lot uh, uh, more precise, rather, than the ones that you get from the test environment if you know that you're still going to integration. So that's part of the trade-off of dumping the integration environment and going directly to production, that you have to have a pretty comprehensive suite of tests uh, to actually test your service before it goes to production. If these APIs are moving in version, that one story is still using a bit older version, while another one yeah. is using another version, right. It breaks unless you have what we have uh, internally, which is a rule that you must support uh, one major version backwards compatibility for at least six months. So you have to work around it, but we think so. You have to. There's a whole bunch of stuff you have to do also on an organizational level in order to to get like the full benefits of this model. But once you do that, it becomes pretty powerful, and it's so. I'm convinced that. If you if you want to have a, a large scale software deployment of something like the bull.com web shop, which has 130 plus services, you're pretty much going to be forced to move to that model anyways, because otherwise it just won't scale within your IT organization. And Mayfly is just a way to Mayfly supports that model fairly well. All right, anybody else? Okay, thank you.